Vampires, bloodthirsty creatures that hunt in the shadows, stealthily luring their victims to deliver a fatal bite. However, most scary of all, they shine under the sunlight? Okay, cut the creepy music. Instead of talking about vampires, let's talk about a way more interesting topic. Let's talk about the disease that could have helped originate the vampire myths, Porphyria cutanea tarda. As a quick disclaimer, we're not here to compare people who suffer from a very real disease to monsters. That's not the objective of this video. Instead, we're here to learn about a disease that doesn't receive nearly the attention it deserves and look at why is it called the vampire syndrome and maybe look at some theories about how this disease is linked to the origin of vampires or how it could be linked to the origin of vampires. With that out of the way, when I talk about vampires, there's three things that come to my mind. One of them is being weak to sunlight. The other one is being thirsty for blood. And the third thing is some contagious element to it, where a vampire can turn another person into a vampire. And let's see how these link up to Porphyria cutanea tarda. Let's start off by sunlight. How does sunlight link into this? When it comes to the modern vampire, sunlight is definitely one of their main weaknesses. We see it in movies all the time. Whenever a vampire steps out into sunlight, their skin starts to boil and blister, and it's usually one of our only defense mechanisms against them. This is largely a reason why vampires are linked to Porphyria cutanea tarda. It's because when people with this condition, PCT, when they're exposed to sunlight, usually their skin can undergo certain changes. But how does this actually happen? How can sunlight affect someone's skin? Well, let's talk about that. In order to understand Porphyria cutanea tarda or PCT, first we need to discuss one of the most important proteins in the human body, heme. Heme is mostly found inside our red blood cells, and it's in charge of carrying oxygen inside the body. In fact, they are what give our red blood cells their red color. And heme is made up of mostly two elements, a porphyrin ring and iron. When there's a problem in the formation of these porphyrin rings, individuals can have conditions termed porphyrias. And these usually include conditions such as acute intermittent porphyria and, as you guessed, porphyria cutanea tarda. When it comes to the formation of porphyrins, there are many complicated steps. However, we're only going to focus on the fifth step of this entire pathway because this is the one that's important for PCT. People with this condition lack the enzyme UROD, or uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. The lack of this enzyme makes so that uroporphyrinogen 3 builds up in the blood as it cannot be converted to coporphyrinogen 3. In other words, the buildup of uroporphyrinogen 3 is going to cause many of the disease or the pathology of porphyria cutanea tarda. Okay, fine, so this compound can build up in blood. How exactly does that cause your skin to maybe burn or lesions to appear in your skin? Well, this molecule, uroporphyrinogen 3, once it goes into your bloodstream and is exposed to sunlight, specifically blue light, at 410 nanometers, it will alter the molecule. This added energy to the molecule can create what's called singlet oxygen species, which essentially they can act with normal human tissue, so they interact with our normal tissues and can disrupt them. In other words, people with porphyria cutanea tarda, once exposed to sunlight, a chemical reaction will happen inside their blood where these reactive oxygen species will be formed and they can interact with normal human tissue and lead to skin lesions. These lesions can be acute, forming petechial and endematous, usually painful lesions, but it can also be chronic, which are usually a lot more devastating. Okay, okay, back to vampires. So when it comes to vampires, at least nowadays, it's pretty straightforward to think that sunlight equals toast when it comes to vampires. However, that's not really the case when it comes to the origin of the myth. Because in fact, the first time vampires were regarded as being weak to sunlight was in 1922 in the movie Nosferatu. So, I guess this doesn't really help our theory that Porphyria cutanea tarda originated the vampire myth. Okay, so maybe this disease doesn't have as much to do with the vampire origin myth as we thought. However, is there a contagious element to it? Like, vampires certainly do. Have you seen Twilight? They have like, an entire baseball team. 
Well, when it comes to PCT, it is mostly familial or sporadic, but it can be acquired later in life, such as because of hepatitis C. This is because hepatitis C causes iron to increase inside your hepatocytes or your liver cells. It can also cause oxi oxidative stress inside your liver, and in some cases can even lead to formation of direct U-rod inhibitors, which inhibit the enzyme and in turn cause PCT. In fact, iron, at least excessive iron, plays a key role in the disease mechanism and in PCT. That's because PCT is regarded as an iron overload syndrome, where iron is excessively high. And if you really think about it, this does make sense because heme is basically porphyrins with iron. So if porphyrins are not made properly, we have proportionally more iron in our bodies. Okay, fine, but how does this help the vampire myth? I mean, vampires usually spread between themselves, However, when it comes to the origin of vampires, this is not entirely true. In fact, the first time that vampires were treated as transmissible, as in spreading from person to person, was in 1952 in the book I Am Legend. Yeah, you heard me right. I Am Legend, the 2007 film adaptation starring Will Smith, is not actually about zombies. Instead, it's about vampires. And personally, I'm really excited about I Am Legend 2. I can't wait to see it. Okay, so porphyria cutanea tarda is not really transmissible. Maybe this disease doesn't really have anything to do with the vampire myth. Okay, let's try to save this. What about drinking blood? I mean, that's the one thing that unites all vampires. Even this guy drinks blood and he's a vampire. Does people with PCT drink blood, maybe? Well, while it is true that from an origin perspective, all vampires drink blood or in some way consume the life force of other beings. When it comes to Porphyria cutanea tarda, there were some theories around giving people blood. And this was mostly around by them ingesting blood. It would stop their bodies from producing heme. And so it would theoretically alleviate the symptoms of the condition. However, this is not really true and it doesn't really make scientific sense. Because when someone actually ingests blood, it's very unlikely that the heme inside their blood would go through an entire digestive system unscathed and still be able to be used by the person who ingested the blood. In other words, it doesn't really make sense and this theory is widely disregarded as being valid. So giving blood for people with PCTs, probably not true. Okay, okay, before we move on from PCTs, while I still have your attention, let's talk about some interesting factors about the disease. One of them is there's usually some link to alcohol consumption. In fact, 80 to 90% of people with PCT have some history of alcohol consumption. On top of that, the disease also has some liver symptoms. Usually liver enzymes are elevated, such as AST and ALT. On top of that, people with, with porphyria cutanea tarda usually have a change in the color of their urine. It becomes more of a tea color. And this is because of the uroporphyrogen 3 being excreted in the urine. When it comes to treating the condition, there's, there's pretty much three ways. One of them is avoiding sunlight, the other one is hydroxychloroquine, which no one really knows how it helps, but it does. And also phlebotomy, which is basically removing some of the person's blood. This makes sense, it's mostly to remove some of the excess iron that these people have. Okay, so if PCT didn't originate the vampire myth, then what did? I'm so glad you asked that, because it's a bit uncertain. There are many creatures from many different cultures that have vampire-like creatures, such as the Strigoi from Romanian culture or the Lugat from Albanian culture. The leading theory on how the vampire myth originated is actually from misunderstood diseases and disease outbreaks. For example, long ago when there was a sudden disease outbreak and entire towns and villages would be killed or would die because of the disease, people really wouldn't be able to explain why. So they'll turn to the supernatural and say the vampires or monsters ended up killing these people. In fact, the vampire myth became so popular and people were so scared of them that they started grave digging and when they opened people's graves, they would find the bodies with blood in the corner of their mouths and their bellies bloated and they would think, oh well, this body definitely came up at night and went hunting for people. In reality, these are just normal symptoms of death and they have nothing to do with well, the dead resurrecting and going on a hunt. Actually, because of the vampire myth, the Empress of Austria had to send her physician 
to write a scientific paper and disprove the existence of vampires and also create a, a ban on grave digging, which makes sense. However, these local myths became immortalized when authors such as Bram Stoker wrote famous literature pieces such as the Dracula, which wasn't really that famous at the time, but became famous afterwards after a massive copyright issue happens when a company adapted this play into movies and theaters without appropriate authorship. So I guess the real monsters in this story aren't really vampires, but instead copyright infringements. To finish off this video, Porphyricute and Atarda probably didn't originate the vampire myths. That's because, well, vampires were just different back then. Originally, they were more like animalistic and ferocious creatures, such as the Mananangal from Filipino culture, instead of the conflicted, romanticized anti-heroes such as Damon Salvatore and Edward Cullen. PCT makes us reflect on the importance of treating patients, understanding their perspectives, and listening to their sometimes unique or unusual symptoms, as I'm sure many doctors would be skeptical to diagnose patients with a disease as rare as Porphyria cutanea tarda. I guess PCT also makes us reflect on the importance that disease can have in culture and the importance that culture can have in disease. It's impressive to see how the stories we tell each other evolve and change over time and how that in turn can impact us. Thank you for watching.